Good afternoon. Welcome to the Maison Française. I am very happy to launch today a new series of dialogues around French art and culture in the major museums of the Washington DC area. Each month, we will propose a dialogue with a curator from a major institution to discover the rich collections of his or her museum, focusing on some, focusing on some specific works of art. This discussion series will be moderated by Vanessa Badre, whom I am very happy to introduce. Vanessa is currently an American University faculty fellow. She is a lawyer, art historian, and keynote speaker, specializing in observing and analyzing works of art to explore broader social and economic themes and concepts. You can discover her activity, including lectures and seminars, on her website, www.vanessabadre.com. Our first guest is Wilfried Zessler, Chief Curator at the Hillwood Museum, whom I thank for accepting the invitation. I am very happy to give you the floor, Vanessa, for this fascinating dialogue. Hello, hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure and a great honor to welcome and to introduce uh, Wilfried Zeisler for this uh, first uh, uh, museum series. Uh, um, well, Dr. Wilfried Zeisler is uh, has impressive uh, credential. Um, he is the Hillwood Estate Museum and Gardens Chief Curator, so he is somebody very important. That's why we are very proud to have him tonight. Um, he is a graduate of Sorbonne University and the Ecole du Louvre in Paris. So the Ecole du Louvre is really a, a dream. It's a place wonderful and marvelous to study right in the, at the core of the Louvre Museum. So it's a, it's a wonderful uh, experience. Uh, Wilfried um, has written extensively, of course, on French and Russian decorative arts, uh, including a book on French ceramics commemorating the French-Russian alliance. Of course, he has uh, contributed and, and had written many articles and uh, contributions to, to books. Uh, the title of his dissertation is uh, The French Objet d'Art and Luxury Goods in Russia. It was written in, in French. And the, the word objet d'art is, is not translated in English, so we, we, we keep it. And uh, his dissertation was published in Paris in 2014. So since 2009, uh, Wilfried, Dr. Wilfried Zeisler has participated and in and curated exhibitions in Paris, Monaco, and of course, Washington, DC. Uh, at Hillwood, maybe, um, Many people have seen his most recent exhibitions, um, whose titles are as follows. Fabergé, Rediscovered in 2018. Uh, Bouc de Vries, uh, and the topic was War and Pieces in 2019. And in 2020, Natural Beauties, Exquisite Works of Minerals and Gems. So everything made, made by Dr. Wilfred Zeisler. Uh, he had also co-authored uh, a book whose title is Constantin Makovsky, the Tsar's Painter in America and Paris in 2015. And he is also the author of Fabergé Rediscovered and Vivre la Belle Époque à Paris, Paul de Russie et Olga Palais, both published in 2018. And of course, as uh, every uh, curator he has a lot of books in part in, in, in where he's working on, on many books. Uh, and now he's currently working on two book projects, one exploring the connections between the Yusupov and Parisian culture, and the second on the collection of Hillwood founder, Mrs. Marjorie Post. So it's really a great honor, a great pleasure to have you with us for this uh, first uh, series. Um, and I would like to begin with by uh, asking you a first, uh, a first question. Um, of course, in Washington DC, uh, everybody has heard about Hillwood, uh, but could you tell us uh, a few words about the specificity and the originality of Hillwood Museum, please? 
Thank you very much, Vanessa. Thank you for having me tonight. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce you all to our institution, to the Hillwood Estate Museum and Gardens here in Washington, DC. It's actually an estate of uh, about 25 acres in the Northwest um, area of Washington. It was a former house of Marjorie Post, our founder. And here you can see the Georgian style you know, of the mansion, which is where we store uh, and present our uh, main collection. And here is actually a portrait of our founder, which was done in the 1930s by this uh, successful English artist, Frank Salisbury. Uh, and it was done in the 1930s. And Marjorie Post was the only child of C.W. Post, uh, the founder of Postum Cereal, which uh, later was known as General Foods. And so as the only child of this entrepreneur, she would inherit the um, family business in 1914 and take over and develop it. And so she's must be known as a business person, a philanthropist, and of course, a collector. And she lived in different, you know, cities where we are located in Washington, D.C. So we are on the hill uh, in the center of Rocky Park. And what is circled, maybe it's hard to see, it's actually the Washington Monument. So we are in the district in the city. And as I said, so it's a mansion where you can enjoy the collection. It's a garden. And the garden is divided, I will say, in two different parts. You have the more formal uh, part of the garden. You can see it here on the left, the French parterre, inspired by French tradition of gardens. And on the right, a large part of the garden is also more woodland. And you can see here one of our trail that you can enjoy uh, when you visit us. And in addition to uh, the gardens, the mansion where the permanent collection is, we also have special exhibitions. and. Inside the mansion, of course, you have over 20,000 works of art. They are not all on view. We have about 25% of our works of art on view, mostly uh, Russian art, but also French art. And I will give you a minute more details about that. But I uh, just wanted to give you a background about the Russian art aspect of our collection. So we are considered one of the largest collection of imperial Russian art outside of Russia. Um, we have uh, about 500, I mean, we have more than that, but 500 objects uh, from the Russian art collection are presented in this icon room. You can see here on this slide, the icon room is actually the chamber of treasures or cabinet of curiosity or Schatzkammer uh, built by Marjorie Post where she gathered all of her Russian works of art. And she uh, fell in love with Russian culture, as I used to say, when she actually in the 1930s was able to travel to Soviet Russia uh, with her husband, Joe Davis, who was just appointed uh, ambassador of the uh, United States uh, to Moscow. And uh, she lived actually about one and a half years in Russia, in Moscow. And at that time, the Soviet regime was still uh, selling off part of the imperial heritage and so she was able to buy from state-run antique shops treasures, and that became her the, the beginning of her passion for this Russian culture that she was going to mix with her French culture. She began uh, to collect wests. And um, here you can see just an example, and that's why we are famous for. Um, so part of our Russian collection include actually two imperial uh, Fabergé Easter eggs, uh, Fabergé uh, sounds very French, but he's very Russian. Uh, the name is from French origin, but um, he left France, the family left France uh, in the 17th century and settled later in Germany and then finally in Russia in the mid 19th century. And um, it's during the late 19th century that Fabergé became famous by creating these amazing imperial Easter eggs. And here are the two we own on this slide. Uh, shown close and open. They are unfortunately empty, but the surprise didn't come with the eggs when Marjorie Post acquired them. And they are part of the iconic pieces we own. And just to give you a sense, there are only 52, 50 or 52, depending on how many we count them, but, and we have two in our collection. So that I think gives uh, an overview of what you can uh, expect uh, to experience when you come to visit us, uh, Russian art, but also a lot of French art. Thank you, Wilfred, for this uh, very interesting introduction. I, I feel that we are very privileged to have this tour with the curator in chief. Uh, we are very, very fortunate. Um, so now, um, what, uh, what would be the most emblematic masterpiece of the museum. We have toured the gardens, we we shown up, we, we saw of course this, this 
absolutely exquisite and beautiful eggs uh, by Fabergé, but uh, what is the most uh, emblematic um, masterpiece in the museum? Well, I mean, there are several, but since uh, I wanted to focus on the French culture and French art, I chose the French piece. And I know Marjorie Post is mostly known for her um, as a collector of decorative arts, but I chose to start with a painting because I think uh, it says a lot about her taste and actually the uh, success of uh, French art and French culture abroad. Um, and this is actually a wonderful royal painting uh, made by uh, Jean-Marc Natier, uh, who was one of the most uh, successful and prominent, very famous uh, portraitists during the reign of Louis XV. And this is a portrait of the Duchess of Parma and her daughter Isabel. And the Duchess of Parma was actually the daughter of King Louis XV of France. And this is one of uh, several portraits that Natier did of um, you know, members of the French royal family and of the Duchess of Parma uh, as well. And as uh, Natier was so famous and so successful, he would, it was actually traditional at that time for portraiture, he would actually reproduce you know, successful compositions such as this one in a garden, uh, very fashionable, very naturalistic, typical of the mid 18th century. Um, and uh, actually use uh, faces he would have painted uh, prior to that, and he will keep as a model and repeat them on different, uh, you know, uh, versions or different paintings in different compositions. And for royals or clients, it was absolutely wonderful because they will have the same face on each portrait at different time of their life, so they will never actually age. Um, on this uh, portrait, you have also, I mean, they look uh, wonderful, they are very typical, and you can see the 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 the, the daughter of with the fifteen, so um, uh, holding uh, the, the the lily uh, flower, which is a symbol of the French royal family. So really a symbol of their status and position at court. And this is a portrait which was documented from the mid 18th century and uh, typical of this uh, symbol of, you know, the old regime of France that, you know, collectors such as Marjorie Post will love to acquire. And she actually bought that piece in the 1920s when she was then living in New York. And actually when she moved to New York in the late 1910s, it was a time when uh, many collectors in the US were building this amazing art collection and everyone, everything had to be 18th century French, uh, was very fashionable at that time. I can just think about, you know, the Freck collection, which is really famous, of course, of that same period. And of course she worked with the same dealer and tastemaker of the time, such as Dubin and other art dealers. And Duvin will actually, um, he was a renowned art dealer and he will, you know, advise her and she will buy art from him. And so not only paintings with royal connections that like this one, but also pieces of furniture and decorative objects from France. And this painting I chose because it's actually representative of that taste, but also of how progressively she, uh, Marjorie Post, built her taste for uh, French 18th century art and culture. And just to give you a sense, I wanted to show you, and that's thanks to the richness of our archives, to show you how uh, this piece look like in her former houses because Hillwood, as I said, was acquired in 1955, but Marjorie Post had different homes prior to that, and she will move her collection from a home to another. So uh, today, actually, we can almost recreate the history of her different homes through our collection, which is a sort of summary of her different uh, tastes. Um, here you can see uh, in the main room in this New York apartment she had uh, built in the 1920s, which was a huge triplex apartment of 54 rooms. And this was one of the main reception rooms, the French drawing room, French room, of course, uh, in the French 18th century style with uh, the portrait uh, I just mentioned she acquired and as a pendant to create a pair, you have the portrait of the Duchess of Parma and her daughter Isabel, and then the other side, Marjorie Post and her youngest daughter. So the daughter to the king and the daughter to, uh, you know, CW Post here with her own daughter. So it's sort of parallel uh, about her, you know, taste and how she 
used French culture and French 18th century art as a model. And I circled on the same uh, photo objects she acquired at the same period from Duville, for example, such as this table, which is an 18th century French table um, showing the know-how of French cabinet makers of the 18th century, which she acquired um, as a piece that made, might have belonged to Queen Marie Antoinette, because of course, Queen Marie Antoinette and her lifestyle and her story were, was a model that, uh, of course, um, foreign collectors and also French collectors love to, you know, uh, follow up as, as a sort of source of inspiration and like to find objects which had connection with the Queen of France. And as you can see, which was put on that table in the 20s in the New York apartment of Marjorie Post, shown here on this slide with this small photo. It's actually uh, Marjorie Post um, wearing a ball costume inspired by uh, a, a, an historic costume of Marie Antoinette. So she was, uh, masquerades were very popular in the 1920s and Marjorie Post had several costume made, including one, uh, several actually featuring Marie Antoinette. And here is one example. On the other side, uh, in connection to this painting still, on the other side of the same room in the New York apartment, you had actually French 18th century tapestry, which are still at Hillwood today, and circled here two wonderful pieces of furniture that Marjorie Post acquired in the 20s from Duvine, again, the same dealer. And uh, here, these are what we call jewelry cases, or uh, so which were uh, very popular in the 18th century. There were several made. They have, uh, they are French. They are by Martin Carlin, a famous cabinet maker, and who was known to use actually um, a plaques of uh, Sèvres porcelain, the famous uh, French uh, manufactory, inlaid here, so to create and bring this colorful aspect to these pieces of furniture and the. Uh, uh, first example was known, um, had been delivered for Queen Marie Antoinette and several had been made. And so Marjorie Post had two. And I will say, unfortunately, she gave them to her daughter, who was also a Francophile and who lived in Paris. And that's why nowadays these two pieces of furniture, uh, you can see them one at Versailles and one at the Louvre. Uh, both were given by Marjorie Post's daughter to uh, actually the, the, to France uh, in the second half of the 20th century. But we still still have a few objects, you know, uh, in our collection. And uh, the main um, pieces from our French collection from the 18th century are actually today at Hillwood in the French drawing room. And here is a detail of uh, our wonderful portrait I was showing uh, to you and surrounded by a selection of our 18th century French, you know, furniture and objects, such as a table I just mentioned earlier on, but here also other example that Marjorie Post acquired in the 1950s uh, for Hillwood. On the left, for example, this exquisite swivel chair, which uh, has stamps uh, stating that it once was owned um, by the Queen of France, Marie Antoinette, so that it belonged to her household. And on the right, uh, the uh, large armchair is actually a modern wood structure from the 20th century, but the tapestry was made at the Gobelin, the famous tapestry manufactory in Paris in the late 18th century, and was part of a set of uh, Gobelins that the Queen of France uh, Marie Antoinette and the King Louis XVI presented to the uh, Prince of Prussia in the late 1780s. So a diplomatic gift and an extraordinary piece as well with royal connection. So that gives you a sense of, you know, around that piece, that portrait of Marjorie Post's interest for 18th century French uh, culture. Thank you very much, Wilfred. I'm, I'm sure we will all go to Hillwood to discover or to see again this portrait by Natier. And uh, it's interesting to see that it's an emblematic piece of the collection. And at the same time, it is emblematic of the, the painting by Natier with this beautiful dress in blue. And, uh, and uh, we know that there is a special blue by Natier and it's even an expression. Now, if we are talking about blue, we are, we are going to say, oh, you know, it's a dress that is bleu Natier. So, so it's, it's really a wonderful for us to, to see this, uh, to admire this painting at, he at Hillwood. And uh, for, for myself, for sure, I will, I will go again very soon. 
um, now I, I can't resist the temptation to ask you the, the usual question, and of course the most difficult. Uh, what is or what would be your, your favorite piece in this marvelous collection? So what I usually see to this question, because I have it you know, often, is that I have too many pieces uh, <laughs> that I like and they change on a regular basis because you know our collection is quite large. So it gives us um, often the opportunity to study some of the pieces which are in storage or we are focusing on other pieces because of specific projects we are working on. And uh, for today's actually, I said, well, I think we should, I, I, my favorite will be a, a French piece, of course, which also represent a very uh, important aspect of our collection. So I was, you know, talking about Marjorie Poe's interest for 18th century French culture, but she also was interested in her contemporary uh, creations of French, you know, culture and French art. And um, she is known as uh, for having been one of the uh, major clients of many jewelers, American and, you know, French and others, but especially from Cartier. And here I selected for you today this frame, <clears throat> which is a wonderful frame from the 1930s. We have about 130 pieces by Cartier in the exhibit, in the collection. So jewelry, but also decorative object, which is quite rare. And this piece is made of, you know, has this very simple art deco design, very modern, I think. So, and I think they work well with 18th century also um, art and design. They are made of precious material, <clears throat> lapis lazuli for the, the, the base, agate and gold and light blue enamel. And uh, here it's a piece uh, featuring a, uh, a portrait of Marjorie Post, our founder. Uh, and what I like about our collection that sometimes, you know, you can see when you look closely to some of our portraits or photographs, you know, objects that we actually still own. <clears throat> and here she's actually framed in a Cartier frame wearing a Cartier piece of jewelry. And the necklace you can see her wearing on this uh, portrait is the one you can see on the left. And what, I, what you see on the left is actually the back of this amazing piece of jewelry. It's a pearl necklace uh, that Marjorie Post commissioned in 1930s from Cartier, New York. Cartier became really successful in the late 19th century. Family members opened branches in London, in New York. And once it was opened in New York, Marjorie Post became a, a really great client of Cartier. And when she was traveling, she would also visit Cartier's boutique uh, in Paris. And that necklace here was commissioned in New York. But what I love is the fact that all these diamonds and this large you know, diamond in the center, which is around five carats, is the class of the necklace. So you will see that at the back and the front are the pearls. <clears throat> Originally, the uh, necklace was made of natural pearls, but she later actually distributed these necklaces, these pearl, natural pearls to her daughter. And so the, she had them replaced by cultured pearls uh, in the 60s. But still, it's a wonderful piece, uh, which gives you a, a nice example, you know, of our Cartier collection. And I like how, you know, you can connect several objects together because of the uh, specific iconography of this small miniature portrait, which is painted on ivory. She was really into... Um, you know details and she uh, had an um, uh, she knew exactly how she wanted to be featured and also how the detail of the miniature had to match the detail and the color or the pattern of the frames so that's i think it's a wonderful example of uh, our collection and one of the pieces that i really enjoy um you know curating and and um, having the opportunities to, to study great thank you um we have another question, but you already gave us some clues. Uh, but what would be the main topic of the museum? Uh, what would be the common thread in all the works of art shown in, in the museum? Um, I, we could all guess that there would be something about French art and Russian art. But uh, well, what, what, what would it be? Well, I think it's really that what speaks to this connection. So yes, when you come to visit it, you can learn about French 18th century art, Russian imperial art, 
and culture, uh, American lifestyle also in the 20th century. But what really connects many of our uh, works of art is actually the, the objects that speaks to the uh, success of French culture abroad. So in the US, of course, because they were collected by Marjorie Post, but also um, you know, we have a lot of examples of objects which we are French made for, for the Russian court. And let's start with one of the wonderful, uh, you know, very known Franco Five, which, uh, who is Captain the Great. And I will say that Marjorie Post, who maybe we could say began being interested in French culture with Marie Antoinette, continued to be interested in Russian and French culture through Captain the Great. And here we have one of the many portraits of the Empress we have in our collection. Uh, which was made at a very rare, actually, composition uh, model, which uh, we only know another version, a full-length portrait of this um, uh, image of the Empress, which is at the Hermitage. This one is in our collection and was done by uh, Pierre-Etienne Falconet, who is a lesser known uh, portraitist painter from the second half of the 18th century, but he was actually the son of um, uh, the famous sculptor Falconet, who was invited to come to St. Petersburg uh, by the Empress uh, Catherine uh, to create the famous uh, sculpture of the um, of Peter the Great, which is still, uh, you know, one of the most famous monument um, uh, in St. Petersburg. And here she is featured uh, as an empress, uh, wearing, you know, the uh, crown on her top of her head and having these orders uh, of St. Andrew and the military order of St. George and the blue ribbon of the order of St. Andrew, which are like high um, uh, orders uh, from, from Russia that she's wearing here on her dress. So this is really a, a great example of this kind of very strong connection and artists working for the Russian court and for Catherine the Great. And I have to say that, you know, we have a lot of object which speaks to uh, Catherine the Great and France. And one of the piece is one only piece, but we are so proud to have it and so happy to have it from a very famous service, uh, a set of China of porcelain that Catherine the Great commissioned uh, in the 1770s from the famous French porcelain manufactory at Sèvres. <clears throat> and she was so, you know, uh, interested, involved in her commissions that she was really choosing the detail, the motif, how it should look like, the color. And it became one, um, it's sometimes said, one of the most expensive service ever made at Sèvres. It was a service for um, um, 60 guests, if I well remember, over 700 pieces. Most of them are still at the Hermitage today, but a few left Russia already in the 19th century. And we have one ice cup that you can admire here with this blue background, which is a typical blue, uh, bleu de sève, bleu céleste, very typical that she absolutely wanted for this uh, service. The design is neoclassical, which was really the taste of the Empress of Russia. And especially what's interesting here, this little painting here, uh, of a profile in the antique style, which is inspired by cameos, is carved, you know, half stone from the 18th century. And we know that Catherine the Great was one of the major collector of cameos and entirely of half stone, um, of carved stone in the 18th century. And so she really wanted to have these models uh, on um, in a painting inspired by her taste uh, on these uh, porcelain pieces. And that's why it's actually called the cameo service. So Cap the Great, um, through commission, through portraiture, through commission she did, we have in our collection, but also uh, objects that shows how Catherine the Great somehow became an iconic figure that inspired uh, French um, makers and taste makers. And for example, in our collection, we have a large collection of French 18th century gold boxes. And um, some of them uh, are uh, came from a very famous Mercant of Luxury. The Mercant of Luxury in 18th century France were the tastemakers of the time. They were like very uh, uh, connected with the best jewelers or makers of the time and knew the best clientele. And some of them became so famous that sometimes as a foreigner, when you come to Paris, you will have to visit their shop and, and, and choose you know, what was the latest fashion of Paris. And here, for example, from uh, Petit Dunkerque, Le Petit Dunkerque, was uh, one of these famous shop of luxury in Paris. You have here two examples of these round gold boxes on the right, uh, one very innovative, especially in the design. 
uh, of this enamel work, which is trying to imitate a leopard skin, which is quite of amazing with this sort of like orange color and this black stain on the top. So which is typical of this sort of always research of new trends, new style uh, in French decorative arts and luxury goods. And on the left from the late 18th century, we don't know uh, if it was a special commission or just because it was a famous, you know, person, a figure of the time. So it's actually a, a box again with a new technique, the Ver Eglomise. It's actually a painting underneath a piece of glass that you can see here. And it features actually the Empress Catherine the Great as Minerva. So as a, a goddess of wisdom and reason. And uh, that's a very rare example and an interesting, you know, um, example of a French maker, you know, producing a box with a portrait of a foreign ruler, uh, Catherine the Great. So um, something very typical of the kind of goods that you could find um, in France at that time and that um, made French luxury goods quite uh, famous. And this mix between, I will say, luxury, new design, new technique is really typical of, you know, this uh, French luxury goods and that made them so appealing to foreign clientele. And we can find it here uh, again with an other example, uh, which is a piece I really <coughs> enjoy myself because it's a piece that <coughs> I knew for a very long time, uh, even before uh, I was hired by Hillwood because it was part of my research. It's a French piece commissioned by the Russian court. So it was really wonderful to be able to look at it and study it. It's a pendant watch uh, from the 19th century, from the period of the Second Empire from 1866. Uh, it's made of precious materials, so mother of pearl, uh, gold, and has, you know, it's a watch and it's um, has also very significant design here, which helps you identify the history behind this watch. And that's also something I like about our collection. And that also was something important for our founder, not only to acquire, you know, pieces, uh, exquisite pieces made by the best makers or with the, the, the most fashionable design, but also pieces that has a very strong story to share and to tell. And here, of course, you see that and you can see uh, these two coat of arms. You have the coat of arms of Russia, the double headed eagle. You had the coat of arms of Denmark. And this watch, which was made in Paris at the Palais Royal by Charpentier Houdin, which was uh, one of the most famous uh, watchmakers of the time, actually commemorates the union between Russia and Denmark. And actually, so the union between Alexander, the future Alexander III, and his wife here, a uh, future Empress Maya Fedorovna, born Princess Dagmar of Denmark. And we know that because of the coat of arms, but also because when you open the watch, as you can see here, there is a miniature portrait of uh, the future Alexander III. So it's a really a, a touching commemorative piece that we think was presented by um, Alexander, uh, the Grand Duke Alexander to his future wife at the time of their engagement. And um, this engagement actually has also a strong uh, connection to France because Alexander, uh, future Alexander III was uh, engaged to Dagmar, future Empress Maria, um, in, uh, only because his brother, uh, the heir to the throne died in Nice in South South France in 1865. And because of this, because he was engaged to, Ma, to Dagmar prior to that, so because of the death of his brother, so uh, in Nice in France, so Alexander uh, got engaged to Dagmar and that's how the union happened. But so there is a strong connection due to France and also an important part of Russian history through this event and then through this piece, which is now in our collection. And I was talking about design and also about technology. Yes, it's a pennant watch by the best watchmaker of the time. But this photo specifically is signed by Lafont de Camarsac, uh, who was a very successful um, photographer of the time who developed actually new techniques of printing photography and printing them on enamel. And that's one actually of the first example of that new technique. So there is also this new technology which can be told uh, when you study this piece. And uh, the piece was so, so extraordinary because of the commission, because of the material, because of the design, because of the technology that it was actually shown by Charpentier Houdin 
at the uh, Exposition Universelle of World Fair in Paris in 1867 and was reproduced in many of the catalogs uh, published at that time. So I think this object speaks a lot about, uh, you know, one of the trends we have in our collection, which is this French-Russian connection. Thank you. I'm sure everybody is dying to go and see this object. So uh, the museum is open. Please come. You just have to enroll on the website. But the museum is open and, and very, very easy to, to come and, and, and visit. Um, there was a little question about the size of the ice cup. Is it a gigantic one or, or, or something very, very tiny? Very small. It's very small. It's like almost a the size of a coffee cup. A very nice, like a, an espresso coffee cup. Oh, so. to put ice, but for vodka or what was the purpose? No, it's ice cream. It's for dessert. Ice cream. Oh, yes. I see. Ice cream. I yes. understand. So small, uh, small cup for, for yeah, ice. Yeah, because I mean, in the 18th century, it was hard to uh, have, you know, ice cubes to maintain the ice very hard. So you will most likely kind of drink it. Because I, it was not as hard as it is nowadays. I see. Um, well, I'm, I'm for myself. I'm, I'm dying to go and, and see and to pay attention because I saw this cup, but I, I must admit that I haven't paid so much attention. But now I, I'm sure everybody wants to go and, and see. And uh, even if we can't try it, we at least we will. We will. See. No. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, usually we say, well, scholars say that a work of art, a painting is explained by the cultural, the political, economical context. Uh, but at the same time, a painting has also a lot to tell us about a culture and an epoch. Um, we can observe a painting through the lens of social and cultural art history, but we can also consider a work of art through the lens of current event. So, I'm sure that you guess what I'm, I'm going to ask you. Well, the most uh, pregnant, uh, important current event is, is the pandemic. So, so how the museum, how did you ask the curator in chief, how did you deal with the pandemic apart from the fact that the museum has been closed for a while? Well, yeah, I mean, we have been, we have followed the rule and we reopened reservation, as you said, but yes, we have like some stories about what happened to our, you know, collection. I mean, yes, as a curator, we don't travel anymore to give conference, so we are on Zoom right now. Uh, that's, you know, one of the consequences, but it has also consequences on our collection. And here I'm going back to actually our French drawing room and actually on the other side of the room, you have one side, you have the Nati I showed you earlier today. And then on the, on the other side, you have this one wonderful portrait. One is from the 18th century, speaks to the royal uh, tea of the period. And on the other side, you have a 19th century masterpiece by Franz Xaver Winterhalter, um, who was a, a German artist, but who was active in Paris and was one of the most fashionable and successful portraitists um, you know, of the 19th century. And he's mostly known for having done, you know, many portraits of, you know, Queen Victoria, Queen King Louis Philippe of France, Empress, Emperor Napoleon III, and Empress Eugenie. And this portrait of Empress Eugenie is a wonderful portrait, it's an exquisite work of art, has an extraordinary provenance, came from the Empress who presented it to uh, one of her, um, court uh, member and stayed within the family of this court member until the mid 20th century when it was acquired through Marjorie Post interior designer uh, uh, French and Co uh, <clears throat> in the 50s. And it has also its original frame, as you can see here, um, you know, at the top of which you have the um, coat of arm of uh, Napoleon of the Second Empire. And so they, and it's also typical of the taste of the period, you know, very 18th century inspired. She's wearing this amazing dress, you know, inspired by 18th century fashion. And as you know, also for us, it makes a perfect connection at Hillwood because uh, Eugenie, the Empress, was is mostly known for having, you know, developed a taste for 18th century France, for Marie Antoinette, you know, patronizing the uh, uh, restoration and um, of Trianon at Versailles, uh, preparing, you know, this ex 
sponsoring exhibition uh, around Marie Antoinette, choosing objects of art that belong to Marie Antoinette for her own interior. So it's 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 a really wonderful piece um, uh, of uh, the story we tell at Hillwood. But to go to uh, you know our current situation with the pandemic, so curators love to travel, you know, to share. Uh, with you know different public in different areas, so we don't travel anymore. But a way to you know share, um, we also uh, participate into different exhibitions. And Empress Eugenie, our portrait, as I like to say, she loves to travel, and she loves to go back to France. And she tra has traveled a lot uh, recently. She has been to Houston in 2016 for the Winter Hatter exhibition. Then she went to Paris uh, at Orsay for the Second Empire. Um, exhibition uh, in 2017, and here she's featured uh, in this wonderful gallery at the Orsay Museum, and it's lovely because she's like facing her son here. So it's just, uh, I think, a wonderful story. And she was continuing, you know, traveling. And in 2019, she left again. Um, in the fall of uh, late 2019, she left again, and here she's like in her crate and she's happy she's going to Versailles for a wonderful exhibition which opened um, in 2019. Um, it was an exhibition called Versailles Revival. So it was exploring actually how in the second half of the 19th century, starting with the Presse Eugenie, Versailles had, you know, um, being a sort of source of inspiration of influence all over the world. And here she's featured, you know, uh, in the exhibition and an exhibition, an exhibition which closed, was supposed to close on March 15, 2020. And for those of you who, you know, remember a year ago, as we will say, so the lockdown started um, actually in France uh, a few days before uh, the uh, actually closing of the exhibition and then a couple of weeks later here in the US. And so a press Eugenie, um, you know, had to stay for several months um, in um, Versailles. So I don't know how happy she was to be there, but she only uh, came back uh, actually uh, over the summer and she, um, you know, uh, was uh, back in the French story room in August. So uh, that's just like a way how, you know, this situation has also impacted, uh, of course, you know, um, exchanges, exhibitions, uh, travels, uh, also for works of art. And uh, still, I mean, she's traveling again soon. Um, so um, she's actually going to Richmond in the fall for another exhibition project. So it's one really of our masterpiece that travels a lot and among others who were stuck and uh, couldn't travel anymore uh, due to the situation. Thank you. Thank you, Wilfried. Really uh, amazingly interesting. Um, I, we, we, are, we are going to have a longer queue of people waiting outside of the garden gate to to come inside uh, the museum uh, we have a lot of questions um, to to ask you um, there are some questions about um, the um, the post family uh, mm -hmm. where, where does she come from mrs post which which from which state so she was born in springfield illinois and then um so her uh, father developed the company in michigan in battle creek that's where everything started and then when she uh, took over in the 1950s she would move to new york uh, where she lived um, until uh, the late 30s and then she traveled as i mentioned in europe a lot with her husband joe davis so first in moscow and then in brussels and then because after moscow he was appointed uh, ambassador in brussels in belgium and so with the outbreak of the second world war uh, they moved back to the us and then they settled in washington dc oh thank you and uh, there is a question also about the fact uh, well, she, she obviously was completely uh, found of, uh, of French and French culture. And uh, um, some people would like to know if she spoke French. I'm afraid not. Uh, I mean, I don't have a certain facts on that, but as far as I know, um, in the you know, um, archives I uh, worked on recently, there is a lot of exchange with you know, French uh, suppliers. I mean, not only jewelers, but also linen, tablecloths, 
uh, fashion and all of that. So usually uh, the invoices and the correspondence will be in English, but sometimes they will actually write to her in French and it's and they start always by, I'm so sorry to write to you in French, but I don't have time and I want this to be you know, quickly sent to you. And it's always accompanied with um, a, a letter tr translated. So I assume that she would ask a translator or someone for her to translate it for her. Yes, she might have some stuff to yes. do the translation work well. I'm sure she has And also time. because she was not dealing necessarily, I mean, that's I mean that's part of the answer, so I am afraid not, but also having this translation was also because she wouldn't deal with all of that, so she would have stuff to deal with it, which definitely wouldn't speak French, but I, I don't think she spoke actually French, yeah. And um, some people are wondering as well if she had some interest apart from French art, you know, if she was interested in literatures, do you have some books or or was she focused only on art or did she had a, a French uh, French interest but for other things? So uh, it's mostly I will say uh, art and uh, I mean uh, portraiture, furniture, gold boxes, I mean porcelain, Sèvres. Uh, especially regarding French culture. So she was, uh, she had a large library and it's still part of uh, our collection today and it has grown, you know, uh, uh, decades after uh, decades. Um, there are some books related to French art, French culture, uh, but mostly um, how she built her collection of books was to support or document her collecting and her collection. So this will be uh, the core of her, let's say, French, uh, you know, like part of the library. But regarding literature, there might be a few books here and there, especially memoirs or uh, books about Queen of Ma Queen Marie Antoinette or other royals. But again, more to support, I will say, her collecting. And at uh, Hillwood Museum, do, do you have a library for scholars, or what, what happened to our collection of of books? Is it available for scholars? Yes, so the library is divided into uh, in different parts. So some of it actually is part of the display. So you can see some of the books uh, on, on, uh, when you go for a tour of the mansion. And if you want to see some of them, you can of course request them. And then what we call the research library, which includes some of the books uh, that she began to acquire. And then she hired a curator in the 1950s to work with her who helped her develop this part of her library. And this is our research library. And we also have archives. And these are available by appointment only for now. But I have a very good news to share that uh, we are uh, inaugurating this year a new uh, collection in research center with a really proper reading room where by appointment also you will be able hopefully starting this summer uh, to come and look at you know our archives and, and books and other special uh, collections in that area of our uh, collection and uh, if you want to have a look I mean the, the uh, we are on our website, you can do research on the library to find out which kind of books we have. Of course, it's mostly a lot of Russian, but we have also, it, it supports really all the aspects of our collection. Great. Um, and there are some questions about her family. You know, uh, we would like to know if she was alone in the world of art, or did she bring her children? Does she, did she have many children? And, Every, because in fact everything was given uh, and uh, as a foundation and now we have the museum and when you explained to us that her house would be changed into a museum uh, and uh, what, what's about the children did they want to have a collection or not how how how, how was it it's a great question um, and all this aspect I love because this is what we are developing for our future publication so it seems <laughs> that many people will be interested in this book which is coming out next year um, so um, yes she had three daughters uh, Adelaide, Eleanor and um, Dina. Dina Merrill was uh, a, a famous actress as you may know um, so some of them, uh, they all inherited like part of, you know, some some uh, part of the art, some some part of the collection, um, some part of course of the jewelry and other things. Uh, some of them had developed, you know, really interest into art, especially Eleanor, who lived in Paris and had a wonderful collection of 18th century art. And actually, she will buy objects for her mother, and then she will also exchange works of art with between both. So she, 
uh, Elia no, uh, Nadri will give her objects. And, and that's, for example, the two jewelry coffer that now are at Versailles, they arrived there to Eleanor. And also I wanted to, to mention that um, um, Marjorie Poe's father was also a collector, but of a completely different uh, aspect where really a gilded age kind of like a uh, taste. Uh, and we do have also part of this collection in storage. So we have actually two, it represents really two, two generations of, of art, two, three generation of art collection in 20th century America. Um, so, um, and I have to say also that the daughters uh, and still the family today is very generous to us and they continue to, give us objects that actually uh, came from, from, from Marjorie Post and which come to enrich uh, our collection. Oh, wonderful. Um, we have also some questions about uh, the, the, the places where she used to live. You talked about uh, Illinois, she came from Illinois. You talked about the, um, the New York, uh, the lavish New York apartment. Uh, you say that she traveled a lot in Europe, in Russia with her husband who was the ambassador. Um, but uh, people would like to know if she had other properties. Sure, she had. Um, so uh, <laughs> um, um, let's say like New York, yes, was at the beginning her main you know, estate. So first the mansion on Fifth Avenue and 92 Second Street. And this mansion was destroyed to build uh, actually a higher building on the top of which you have this triplex apartment. And this, apart this building still exists, uh, but it's now divided into smaller apartments, even though they are still quite big, believe me. Uh, and then she had uh, a large camp, uh, Camp Top Ridge in the Adirondack, so in upstate New York, where she will spend um, sometime in the fall. It's a large, large camp with a lot of cabins. It's really lavish. Um, and it's more, uh, uh, and it's, it's one of her, uh, it was one of her favorite location. And then of course, she, uh, one of her favorite homes was uh, Mar-a-Lago, uh, the famous estate in uh, Florida that she built in the 1920s uh, and where she will spend uh, most of her winters. And uh, this uh, estate was um, uh, sold to the current owner in the 1980s. And, um, and then um, uh, she also traveled, of course, uh, you know, all over the world. And she did that often with her yacht, uh, the Sea Cloud, which uh, she had in the, built in the 1930s, which was, it still exists actually, it's now privately managed uh, by a cruise company. And, um, and also she had a, it was not a home, but she had a Mary Weather, which was her plane she used also to uh, travel. Thank you. Uh, you. You talked about her, a merchant she, or dealer, or dealer she was uh, mm -hmm. working for. And we have a question about uh, uh, any particular antique dealer for the French uh, objet d'art that she bought. Uh, but I think you already answered by talking about this gentleman who, Helped her. I can't remember his name. Duvin, Duvin, Duvin. Yeah, Duvin was one of the main purveyor of, you know, uh, not only French art, but like, you know, what was available and um, um, collected at that time for the British, but also the uh, American collectors. And he worked for, you know, prominent collectors of the period. Uh, but she was also dealing with other uh, art dealers, interior designers, and which I could share the names right now, but they are. Even she bought a lot from them. They are not very, uh, you know, known today. But all will they? All them will be listed in our forthcoming publication. But Duvin is the most famous one, and uh, then she had other dealers based either in uh, London or, or or Paris. And for example, uh, dealers from which she will buy objects with strong uh, French-Russian relationship. Uh, I could see, I could mention, for example, A La Vieille Russie uh, in New York, which originally was based in Paris, or Wolski uh, in London, uh, and she would buy, you know, Russian art there and also French um, gold boxes, for example, or objects with Russian provenance there. Thank you. Um, I have a question about her married life. Well, Mrs. Post was married several times, uh, um, asked uh, one of a uh, person. And uh, but she's known as Mrs. Post. Uh, so so what what is the relationship between the name of her different husbands during her marriage? Um, this is a question about family name. 
So yeah, yeah, absolutely. So Marjorie Post was born Marjorie Post and she married several times, as you said, and usually when she would marry, she would actually take her husband's name um, and sometimes keep both names. So she was uh, Marjorie Post um, uh, Close, Marjorie Post Hutton, Marjorie Post Davis, and finally Marjorie Post May. I mean, uh, but she decided um, to, you know, at the end uh, she was uh, single, uh, so she would take back, keep her, you know, uh, name. Um, so yeah, but usually, so she would have to, when we have some documentation about the fact that, you know, each piece of linen had embroidery or you had like engraved, uh, you know, monograms. So for you, she would have to redo all of that uh, on a regular basis. So. No, we have a question uh, dealing with money matters. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> in sure. fact, well, you, you, well, it's easy to donate to the Hillwood Museum for sure. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> so please do it and, and support. Uh, but there is a question how, about how the museum is financed and uh, what are your plans to continue to acquire art, uh, decorative art pieces uh, that are at the top quality, you know, uh, that could continue the the highest preciousity uh, that uh, you already have in the museum? So yes, that's a great- a lot of money. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's a great question. I mean, so I will respond. I mean, so yeah, there is like one aspect is like, yeah, how we operate and then the uh, acquisition fund somehow. So I will say that we have a very, we have a, an endowment which uh, support a large part of our operating budget, but then for, you know, all the uh, programming, uh, exhibitions, uh, if you want to help us for acquisitions, all of that. So fundraising is also really key for us. And plus our own incomes, which came come from the visit visitors and from you know uh, the shop and the cafe, all of that. So, but yeah, we have an endowment plus fundraising and our own income. So that's for you know how we 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 we, we work. And then uh, regarding acquisition, so we have um, uh, an acquisition fund, which is not necessarily uh, very large because. Um, um, you know, it's not one of our main mission. And for those of you who have been to Hillwood, you can see how busy, I will say, the, how crowded the, the, the permanent collection is. And uh, there are a lot of objects, as I said, 20,000 works of art, about 25% on view. So there are a lot in storage. And that's why also we do this special exhibition. It's a way to showcase, you know, some of our objects from storage, but still um, we continue to collect. Um, uh, especially objects that are either directly connected to our pieces already in our collection. So for example, an additional piece from a service kind of things. Objects which are uh, directly connected to our founder because it's, you know, the collection, some parts went here and there, and then they, when they appear on the market and which it makes sense for us to have them back, uh, we, we will buy them back. And for example, we bought some, uh, in the recent years, some pieces of jewelry, and we are still looking for some jewelry that she owned uh, to enrich our collection. And uh, the last part of our, you know, our, where we uh, develop our acquisition is the Russian collection, because this is really our strength. And I will say especially areas which are maybe less represented from that aspect. And especially the, actually the French Russian connection is something that it makes us very specific and unique. And that uh, we have done recently great acquisition on that aspect. Um, so yeah, we do regular uh, acquisitions and we have a, a little fund to support that. Thank you. Uh, you, you talked about the portrait by Winter Alter, who was uh, unfortunately stuck uh, in, uh, in, in Versailles. Uh, but we have some questions about uh, uh, other pieces of the collection. Do they, do they travel a lot? Uh, do they go to France or do they go to other museums in the world? Um, I understand that the question is about yes, traveling, traveling pieces. What is your, your politic? Sure. Uh, so, I mean, when we have like loan requests, and I should have mentioned that about the winter halter, I mean, yes, it was stuck and then it had to come back. But I will say that the situation has, has helped us also develop some new, you know, ways to do things that we will most likely keep afterwards, after the crisis. So that was a positive thing, because usually such a masterpiece, such as this painting, will travel, you know, with someone from us, you know, be with it all the time, checking that everything is doing 
fine, but you know, with the travel ban and all of that, it was not possible. So actually we were following live, you know, each step of our, so it was not physically with the painting, but we had a sort of camera watching it uh, from our end here. So like, uh, and that was something that is really new to, was new in the sort of museum world. And it's something that most likely we will keep uh, for some of these travels. Regarding, yes, loan requests now, um, definitely when we have a pro you know, loan request from an institution and if we believe in the project and that also it's a piece that it's easy or not too fragile to travel or won't, you know, we won't miss too much uh, because it's like, you know, a key piece in our collection. Yes, we have um, uh, objects that travel on a regular basis. And actually we had another French painting, a Bougro. Our Bougro was stuck also in San Diego due to COVID. Now it's back home. Um, but yes, depending on the project, uh, we, we, we consider and, and then we go through a regular process and yes, it travel sometimes. And, and did you have some works of art that were stuck here at Hillwood that you were not able to give back because of the pandemic? Oh, actually, yeah, I, I, somehow, yes, because we were, so, you know, we up my, the exhibition you mentioned, Natural Beauties, uh, ex, which was an exhibition of exploring like our collection of pieces of semi-precious stones. And we had bought like about 20 objects from the US. So the exhibition opened <clears throat> and then we closed a month after because of COVID. And so COVID was so long the situation that we only reopened in June, but we maintained the um, actually uh, exhibition longer. So the object stayed and the exhibition was open, but some institutions have not necessarily uh, reopen yet. So we still have some object, like uh, we store them for them until they can be sent back. Thank you, Wilfried. So as the moderator of the, of the conversation and, uh, and the master of the clock, uh, it's already 7 p.m., but would you have five more minutes? Because I have thousands of questions. Would you? Would sure, you, sure. You'll Absolutely. Just Thank you. I'm sure everybody is very grateful. Um, well, uh, there is somebody who would like, and I must admit that I didn't know that you had a costume collection. And, and there is somebody who is asking you to talk about uh, this costume uh, collection. So it's a discovery for me. I no, I mean, know. this is a, a great question because I, uh, yeah, I did a bad job. I should have mentioned that. Uh, <laughs> so one aspect of the collection, which um, is very important is that, you know, usually which makes us also very special is that, you know, art collectors such as Marjorie Post, um, will give, you know, to become a museum like the art collection only, but she decided to give, you know, almost everything like including her wardrobe and her accessories and all of this. So we have about 300 uh, pieces of, you know, fashion in our collection that belong to her or her family members. And technically it says um, the history of, um, you know, fashion in the US from the late 19th century to the mid 20th century. So it's pretty impressive. And we have a curator, you know, for the 18th century collection, we have a curator for the fashion and jewelry collection. And so things, you know, dresses and costumes cannot be displayed, uh, you know, on permanent basis for conservation reasons. We do some rotations in the house. So there's always things going on, not only with our exhibition program, but also through the rotations we arrange twice or three times a year in the house. And so where you can see actually some of these dresses depending on different themes or pieces of jewelry on view in the house. So, um, yeah. Thank you. And if I may, th there are a last question, but there are many, many questions. You're, you've been very successful and people seem to be very happy to spend uh, one hour with you tonight. Uh, there is a question about the garden. So uh, as I remember it, it's a, it looks like a French garden. There are a, a lot of uh, little buildings and fabrics. And we have a question about the dacha, the dacha. Mm -hmm. So if you could give us some hint. And, and yes, so the garden uh, is, you know, as I said, half uh, formal, half, you know, woodland. And among the formal aspect, we have the French potter, but the rest is, uh, you know, we have like parts in different styles, uh, including a Japanese style garden. Uh, the dacha, so the dacha was, of course, inspired by these Russian tradition wood houses, and uh, she um, had it built in, in the 1960s, 
Um, and she had one actually in her different homes. She, there is one still in her, there was one in the previous home she had in Washington DC at Trigaron. There is one in her camp in Topridge in the upstate New York in the Adirondacks. And the dacha at Hillwood was built in the late 60s during the lifetime of Marjorie Post uh, to host actually a permanent collection that was presented to her by her very close friend, Mrs. Augusto Rosso. Uh, Mrs. Rosso was actually the wife of the Italian ambassador in Moscow in the 1930s. And actually they were very close friends, Marjorie Post and her. And so they were also collecting Russian art at the same time Marjorie Post was doing in Russia. And so she decided to give the family collection to the museum. Uh, now the collection is actually mixed with other objects from our collection within the mansion. And the dacha is now used for special exhibitions. So it's sometimes open, sometimes it's not. We have two buildings um, in uh, the estate which are actually used for special exhibition. Usually the dacha for our shows from February to June. And then the other building is was built later in the 80s, so after Marjorie Postes. And this is where we have our summer exhibition. And that's where we will open soon our exhibition, Roaring Twenties which will explore actually the, the life of Marjorie Post at that period and where you will see actually about 20 of our dresses. Oh, thank you. So, so now it's, uh, it's time we, we went well, but do you allow me a last question? Sure. Uh, uh, so there is, a, well, I might have a beginning of answer. It's, uh, it's about contemporary art at Hillwood House. And I remember that a few years ago, I. I went in the garden and there were huge uh, faces, uh, sculpture for like Archimbolio faces. Well, mm -hmm. uh, so I suppose it was contemporary. Uh, yes. So you might have some uh, activity with contemporary art. Uh, so if you could develop and, and give some, some details. Absolutely. As part of our exhibition uh, program, we, we try on a regular basis to include actually contemporary art and design into our programming when it's relevant and works with our collection. And um, for example, for some of our exhibition, when we focus on a specific aspect such as porcelain or I said hearthstone earlier on, we always try to include contemporary pieces as well to show how actually these materials are still relevant today, are still explored, source of inspiration for contemporary artists and designer. And we have built actually a whole series of exhibition um, of uh, contemporary artists and designer. And next week we are actually opening uh, an exhibition of um, porcelain flowers, um, which are actually rose sculptures uh, made by artist Vladimir Kanevsky, who is uh, based in New Jersey. And he's actually, this morning I was installing some of them. Um, and this summer we will have a wonderful uh, exhibition in the gardens, 29 um, uh, wires, life-size sculptures inspired by dance, um, um, by Christine Mays, and the exhibition is called Rich Soil, and it's outdoor, so whatever, we're, wherever we will be regarding the pandemic, so no, will be perfect, you know, to visit. Thank you, Wilfried. So I think that now it's really, really time to finish. Thank you for the, the 10 minutes you gave us as a gift. We are My all pleasure. very happy. Uh, and, you know, it is the best when you have the curator-in-chief to to bring you into the garden and the museum. It was a very lavish uh, way to receive us. So thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, and I hope we'll see uh, all the, the, the participants and the, the audience for the next uh, series organized by the Maison Francaise and the uh, Service de la Culture de l'Ambassade de France. Bye. 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 Thank you very much. Can you see me? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, ju just a few words. I'm sorry. Uh, I know the, the, the time is short. Th thank you a lot, uh, Wilfried and Vanessa, for this uh, wonderful discussion. We learned so much. And uh, thank you, Wilfried, for sharing all your knowledge and passion for uh, the, the universe of uh, Marjorie Post and for the universe of, the, of this wonderful uh, museum. And thanks a lot, Vanessa, for uh, sharing and moderating the, the event. I'm sure all the audience will be willing to visit or revisit the, the museums and the uh, see all these works of art with all the explanations you have been giving given uh, during this uh, this hour so, so thank you and the, the next museum series will take place on uh, april 21st 
Uh, it will be dedicated to the exhibition uh, in the Moonless Black Night, Syrian Art After the Uprising, that is currently at the Middle East uh, Institute. Uh, and it brings uh, together the work of Syrian artists who reflect on the last 10 years. So we'll be, Vanessa will be in discussion with uh, several artists uh, whose works are exhibited currently and who also are currently res residing, uh, living in, uh, in France in, uh, in exile. Uh, so beyond the museum series, uh, the Maison Française offers other uh, online events, especially films and talks. Uh, so don't, you can go to the, to the website of the French Embassy. There are some pages for uh, Maison Française. And we really hope to see you very soon. Uh, stay safe and, uh, and healthy. Have a good evening. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.